you know what? Opportunities are just ever. There's more opportunities than there is oxygen in the world if you've got the right mindset. Do you think that um, people need a strong why to be able to take the action? I don't think you can take action without actually being clear on your why. And I got diagnosed with an illness seven years ago that was not currently treatable. And that really made me really kind of like think about my why. And that is ultimately my why is to serve other people. Do you think that anybody can be successful in property business? With the right mindset. Hi, Kevin McDonald here and welcome to the Progressive Property Podcast. On this week's episode of the podcast, I'm joined by Richard Stone. Now, Richard has been years and years in, in construction, working as construction managers for various different companies. And in the last few years, he's decided to move over to building his own property businesses and starting to work for himself. So you're going to absolutely love this. Thanks for joining us, Richard. Thank you. And good afternoon or good morning. I'm not sure so, where we are in terms the, of time. We're halfway between afternoon and morning and afternoon. We are. We're right on the cusp. So thank you. Let's yeah. have a great conversation and give some value to the listeners and, and people viewing at home. So um, you've obviously decided to start to build your own property businesses but for before that so what was before you decided to start to do property yourself you were working for other companies yeah very much so so i was in my first footing at five years old so 40 years ago this year um, and that sort of sense of taking like some packs of bricks some blocks some concrete and creating something tangible was what i loved about construction was building new stuff so i left school at 16 went into got a job at john langs as a trainee management consultant or management trainee, did that for a year, just over a year. We agreed mutually that it probably was best if I left. <laughs> um, I didn't like being a payroll number. From the age of 11, I'd work for landscapers and scaffolders uh, after school and weekends labouring. And I loved it. I loved the crack. I loved the banter. Uh, and as much as I still love the construction part of it, working for a main contractor, that is kind of a little bit missing because it's very much sort of shirt and tie, very kind of like white collar. And I wanted to get back to sort of the banter. I was still really young, so I did that for a while. And then I became a dad at a really young age. Um, and a friend of my ex-wife's said, look, you've clearly got a head on your shoulders. You're doing the books for these two guys as well. You've obviously learned stuff. You've built a house for them. Why don't you go and do stuff in property yourself? And I was like, okay. But at the time, I didn't really have the luxury of just being able to go, do you know what? I'm just going to go and take two years out and go to college. So I did night school, did day release course for myself did that, got a job as a proper site manager for a company. And something in that, that day when they said, look, we want to offer you the job, I kind of felt sort of compelled that I had to sort of return that rewarding investment that they'd given me. Because as much as I'd put myself through college and I'd sort of started to re-believe in, in education, I still felt that they took a bit of a gamble on me because I didn't have the traditional uni education that a lot of people in those roles have. Yeah. And in the next 10 years, I went from site manager to operations director. Left because we tried to do a management buyout, didn't work because the chairman wouldn't let us grow the business. And that was one of the conditions of buying it was that we didn't use bank funding because he didn't want us all in debt and we couldn't grow the business. We can't do an MBO without bank funding and growing the business. It just <laughs> it didn't really work. So I left and went management consulting for a while, which I really enjoyed. Um, I did some fraud investigations at big contractors, did a couple of short term interim management roles. And then sort of decided, you know what, actually, it's great sort of coming in, sort of being here for sort of six or 12 weeks, and you can make a massive difference really in a short period of time. Because a lot of it isn't skill set, it's mindset. And I know Rob talks a lot about that, and it's, that's absolutely my mantra. But it's still very short lived. So I sort of decided then that we were going to set up our own businesses, which we did. And we, we worked a really, really tight client avatar. I did some work um, in brand and marketing, really nailed down a client avatar. Uh, and that's been really successful. But we don't really just want to keep doing that, which is why we started our sort of education and training around property, because we want to sort of become masters of our own destiny and build our own portfolio. So when you said you set up your own business, um, how many years were you in? So you did 10 years in that business. Yep. So 15, 16 left school, did a, did yep. a year with John Lang, mm -hmm. um, then studied for a couple of years, did 10 years in that business, yep. and then did some consulting for a while. So how many years yep. roughly were you consulting? About five years before five I years. went back into other businesses, right. and I did stints of like three or four years in a number of businesses. Right. And then you, when you set up your your property consultancy business yep. initially, what sort of um, what type of companies do you go into? How does that work? So we work, we only work for property and block management clients um, because 
it's nice work, they're nice people, yeah. and we can really make a difference. And for us, we sort of stripped it back to what are our values, and our kind of our core values are honesty, integrity, and education, but a fundamental belief that everyone has a right to a home that's warm, safe, and dry. And there's loads of people that go and build stuff, but there weren't many people that were actually delivering a values-based service in the industry. And we knew it really well because the companies I'd worked at delivered in that sphere. So it made sense to sort of move into that industry, yeah. which is, you know, we what we won awards for doing. So these type of companies, uh, block management, they're building blocks of flats, I guess, and stuff. Yeah, like building and managing, so, more so the management. So it, it was kind of, it was more like major works projects. So new roofs, new windows, new doors, yeah. um, estate improvement work, security upgrades. Um, common part replacements, so take removing asbestos, sorting out fire alarms, sprinkler systems, fire doors, all of that sort of stuff, right. which is why I'm so passionate about that stuff now, because I see so many people that are not doing it right. Yeah. And there's a difference between what you think is right and what's actually right. Mm -hmm. So it was about where we could kind of, where we could have the biggest impact really. Yeah. So that's what made me do it. And then when I started in property training and education, Essentially, we came because we wanted to learn about actually how we could serve ourselves, yeah. how we could kind of like leverage the knowledge we've got, because my wife's really trained as an interior designer. So how we could sort of pull both of those different skills together to actually help and right. serve other people. So when, when did you find Progressive? When was that? Um, it was about two and a half years ago, I think yeah. now. Yeah, and the, the, a while ago. You mentioned about doing the training and stuff. What trainings have you done? <laughs> what trainings have we done? I've got to go on record now. Um, so what have I done? So I did Masopi first of all, so which for, kind of for anybody listening, Masopi is multiple streams of property income. So that's a three-day sort of it's Progressive's flagship event where you learn all the different types of property investment techniques and strategies. So that that's was really the starting point for anybody. That was absolutely right. the starting point, and that was kind of massively opened my eyes because as much as I've done contracts in hundreds of different ways, loads of different forms of contract, to learn the other side of it was really sort of yeah. fascinating, and that, and I was kind of a bit. Not overwhelmed, but I was like, wow. So I sort of took a little step back, sort of sat down and digested everything that I learned, and then thought, right, I need to really do like the master, the master event and actually learn for a few days with like-minded people what all of the different strategies are in a little bit more detail, which I did, and it was a really great event. And then from there, I, did, I joined VIP, and I've done, what have I done since then? So I've done deal packaging course, I've done the commercial conversion course, I've done the service accommodation course, which we're now part of the mastermind on. Um, but the one thing that it kind of lit in me was that I really, really want to use my voice to help people. And looking at how everybody spoke on the stage and talking to some of the speakers, the speaking part of it was the bit that I was like, wow, if I can use that to use my knowledge and skills to help people, but be trained to do the speaking part properly, that's why I decided to do that part as well. Because it felt like for me, that one skill fitted everything, to, yeah. irrespective yeah. of what strategy we were going to do. Yeah. If you're looking to start in property, if you're looking to scale your property investment, then there is a completely free report that you can download in the descriptions and the pinned comments that can help you get started on your property investment journey. For, for anyone who's listening to this thinking, you know, you had 20 plus odd years, I guess, in construction, you knew construction inside out. Why, yep. why did you feel you needed knowledge on how to buy a single let buy to let or do a serviced accommodation unit or package a deal because quite often you meet people in there they listen you, you see them online or you see them post on social media and they say oh well I've, I've learned everything i need to learn in a book but well, you were doing it for 20 years so <laughs> did you not already know enough um i think there's two parts to that i think one is that i didn't really do very well at school so i hated education and i reignited my passion for education much later so I think part of it was that. But also, if you think of it as a sphere, so a circle, the contracting part is only really half of that because if you haven't got a client and you haven't got a project, you haven't got a contract. Yep. So, you know, and it's no coincidence that the HSE and HMRC both say that it all starts with the client. There's a reason for that because it does. So for me, it was about learning that side of it. So actually how to find the deals, how to appraise the deal, how to do the analysis, you know, how to stack it, how to find the funding, all of that stuff. That part of it was completely new to me. I had no idea. And, you know, I've done claims in the tens and sort of 50 million pound plus, but I never knew that side of the funding part of it. And for me, that was like, wow, actually, you know what, if we can do this, you know, we'd got a pot of money we wanted to use, but if we could use other people's money as well and give them a good return and help them, then for us, it was kind of like win-win. So that's so why we got involved. You've obviously done quite a few different trainings. So how has that helped you? Has it been beneficial? Yeah, massively. Some more than others because some I haven't then ended up 
going and taking that as my main strategy, but I've still learned stuff in that room on those days that I still use now. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is actually that my wife is now on board, so she comes to the training with me right. because I'm massively invested in my mindset. And one of my challenges is that I'm an absolute workaholic. I'm just relentless. And my world spins at about a 1,000 miles an hour. But, you know, my wife is amazing, and she's a mum to two children, but her world can't spin at that same pace because she's got all of these other things pulling and pushing at her time and stuff. Yeah. So I would go home, be absolutely buzzing and on fire about what I'd learned. And she's like, look, I'm trying to cook the dinner, sort the kids out, do this. We've got games, we've got this tomorrow, we've got clubs tonight. Just stop. I think you're married to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not, because one of us would be in trouble. And you've got more money than me, so I'd probably lose. But that was a big challenge for me. Um, and I've, I've done a lot of work on my mindset and stuff in the last few years as well, in the last five years. But it was about actually getting all of that training and starting to implement it. Mm. And working out what was best so you know i've done commercial conversions as a contractor right. i've been parachuted in to sort the ones out that other people have got wrong so i understand how that part of it works and understand how to deliver that but for me it was about actually working out the funding part of it and, and that's where the real value has been it is actually that really literally anybody can do this stuff mm. because you don't have to have your own money and you don't necessarily have to have transferable skills what you need to do is leave your ego at the door and say look i don't know this stuff let's go and find a professional team of people that can help me do it. And, you know, for that reason, every single training we've done, we've learned something without a doubt. Now, a lot of people will still probably go back to um, the focus on their own money. And I often say to people that your own money, focus on your money actually holds you back. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, but then they also focus on their experience. So you, I know there'll be people listening to this right now and they'll be saying to themselves, oh, that's OK, though. He still had construction experience. So what did your wife do? Your wife's now in property with you yeah. full time? Yep, Okay. Absolutely. What did she do before property? She was a police officer. She was a police officer for 15 years. Um, she, she got made ill because of her job. Um, she had a nervous breakdown and we had to get her out of that and get her some help, which we did. Um, and that's been a long journey over seven years. Um, she's done press articles for the police about it and police federation. But it's been a really, really tough challenge. You know, she's been on medication for a long time. Um, the, so we've just finished, literally, probably eight weeks ago, our first refurb, complete end-to-end. -end. And when we started it, we said, look, we, there's loads of ways we can do this. It's two and a half hours away from home for a start. I can either take over and I can just do it as project management. We can do it and we'll do the work together because I'm quite handy on the tools and she's an upholsterer. So we've got the skills to do it in-house. Or... I'm coaching and mentoring other people. So actually what we could do is I'm going to just turn my brain off. You're going to work out how to do it and I'm going to coach you through it. And unless the problem is going to bankrupt us, we're going to go with your decision because you're going to learn far more yeah. doing it that way than anybody would, would be able to do in a classroom. You're not going to learn that in a classroom. So that's what we did. We did a refurb and, you know, it's come, the feedback we've had has been absolutely amazing. We did um, listing optimization at Service Accommodation Mastermind last week. We've got really good feedback, but the guest feedback has been phenomenal. But what's been really interesting, and I think the listeners and viewers will sort of take something from this, we've had amazing feedback from people that have paid to stay in that unit, paid their own money to stay in that unit, and have enjoyed their experience. We've had feedback from our own families that's been, it's too expensive, it's over the top, you won't get that night rate, what are you doing this for, this is nuts, you've started it too late, it's the wrong time of the season, it's in the wrong location, it's too far away from home, and bang, 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 every single one, we've had every single thing thrown at us all the way along, we've had issues with the lease, we've had all sorts of issues, and we've just gone, right, okay, how do we work with that, and I think having the kind of a bit of a sort of a, a bit of a robust mindset has been really helpful but just having good people around us as well i mean we go to the mastermind every month and my wife's attitude is that and she puts this in all the different groups she goes that's my dose of broca i go there not because it's orange but because i get my energy uplift and that's what it's like it's the same when i go to expert speaker poor people get their advice from friends and family and neighbors and wealthy people get their advice from people who've done it before them yeah and i would agree with that and i think the other thing that I would add to it is that there is so many people out there who have got opinions. Everybody's got an opinion on everything, even more so since social media. But 99% of it is unqualified advice. And unless that person has actually done the thing they're talking about and done it dozens of times over so they're qualified to have that opinion, 
it's unqualified advice. And yet people take that on board rather than listen to someone that's done something 50 times. I had this conversation with somebody about safety yesterday. They were telling me their scaffold on their site was safe. I'm like, look, mate, I've seen a photo and I can tell you just from that one image, there's enough on there for you to get fined by the HSE. No, 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 my scaffold is all right. Oh, okay, then. It's, it's but crazy. people do listen to other people's advice from unqualified people that d just don't know. So, yeah, it's, it is tough. But I guess the thing for us, we just kind of... Jem's now into reading a lot of personal development stuff. I mean, Stephen Bartlett's latest book is just phenomenal. But it's about actually where do you spend your chips and who do you listen to and whose advice do you take? And you can really, if you're sensible, only take advice from someone who's, who, as I said, has not only done it, but has done it multiple times. Because I worked for somebody once who screwed up a big, big construction project worth probably about two and a half million, I think it was worth from memory. It was a while ago now. And they got to the end of this job by an absolute wing and a prayer. How would they manage to get it done? And they were like, okay, we're going to go and do loads more of this because we know how to do it. And I said, no, you don't. You just know how to screw it up and get out of it. That's not the same as knowing how yeah, to do it. it. So, yeah. yeah, listen to the right people, I'll tell you. So you've done your first service accommodation unit. You got up and running. Yep. Any other projects you're working on at the moment? Yeah, so we've just had an offer accepted on a really exciting project, which is a flat with three commercial units underneath it but we're gonna add quite a lot of value to it. So we're gonna turn it all into SA or service accommodation. Um, but we're also looking, we've got some drawings being worked on at the moment to go up another floor into the roof space and then go sideways to create two more extra units. All right, cool. So, so how did you find that? Was it just through an agent or direct vendor? Um, it's, near, it's near to where our first SA unit was because our strategy is that the unit we've done, we absolutely know the numbers for that. Yeah down to the penny so we just want to replicate that loads and loads of times over and then start building an ecosystem so once we get to 20 we'll sell the first ones because under SA you yeah. know the reasons why we want to do that so we drove we were driving to that to have a look at it and to meet a guest and um, Gemma just saw this building she was like and that's the really weird thing is that she's now seeing opportunity that we would have driven past before because yeah. ever since I've read Rob Moore's book opportunity I'm like do you know what? Opportunities are just ever. There's more opportunities than there is oxygen in the world if you've got the right mindset. But her mindset's changed massively. So we were driving past this building, and all of a sudden she's like, "We could do something with that." So I'm like, "Okay, let's do it." So we sort of went and had a look. Just, just literally, just got the laser out, banged a few measurements around, and was like, "Okay, this is what we can fit in. This is where the services are." Not like this is where a socket is, but this is where the foul is. This is where the electric head is. The kind of hardcore stuff. And we're like, okay, this is what we can chop up. So yeah, so um, we're quite excited about that because we're actually not using any of our own money, are we? Yeah, so um, family money, total stranger money, <laughs> how are you funding it? Um, we're funding it through somebody who we've now met, but previously we'd only met on Facebook um, and had conversations with, and then the rest of it will be backed up by development finance. So, so for anyone listening who are here, you hear this a lot, people say it, and I say it a lot, you will raise money online, you'll raise money from your network, from meeting people, and many people will still go, well, I'm on Facebook, I've never raised money. So do, do you go on Facebook and say, I need money, or do no. these people just, how does it happen? So the first one happened, so it was somebody that's been watching what we've been doing online for a while, and when I say watching what we've been doing online, just talking about what we're doing, not saying oh, I want money or this is, we're amazing, just literally documenting our story. So, you know, it might be a post, like, and I'll quite often post about problems, challenges we've got of things that are happening. And they were just like, we can see that like, you're pretty smart people, you must be in this for a reason, can we get involved? So we're like, okay, so we'll have a chat. So we've had a conversation with them, they're really keen and really interested. Um, we're helping them sort out, they've got lots of individual small pensions. So we're helping them with a SaaS provider to actually get that sorted so that they can use that SaaS money to invest. Okay, just hold there for a moment. So for anybody listening to this and you're wondering what SaaS is, that's S-S-A-S. -S. It's a small self-administered scheme. So you might have a pension at the moment with, um, for instance, I had my pension with legal and general when I was in a corporate job. And you can get a transfer value of that pension and convert it into a self-administered scheme. So where you basically become a trustee of your own pension pot. You can then take that pension and you can either lend it to other people or you can lend it to your own limited company 
and buy residential property or commercial property or you can even buy commercial property within the pension pot so just have a look at SAS SSAS and find out a little bit more about it but many people listen to this right now are sitting on money they probably didn't realize they could access take control of your own future so and you can help other people as, as you're clearly doing. Yeah, so. so we've got two people that we're, do, we're doing that sort of that arrangement with now. One person that we literally met from Facebook, somebody that I met through LinkedIn um, about three years ago. We've done some work, she's done some work with me, she's helped me with my public speaking stuff. Um, and she just looked, said to me, look, I get what you're doing, can we have a conversation about it? I've got a guy that I know in France, we've never even met him, but he's also he also wants to get involved and then We've also gone through and done that whole exercise and literally just gone through and chased all these pension companies down. And we've actually found like a pension we didn't even know we had. Billions but, you know, of pounds. Billions of pounds in pensions. Um, it's unbelievable. So, so from that perspective, that's what we're looking at doing. Um, but the conversation we've had with the development funder is because of the experience we've got, they actually have said to us, look, you can do up to 10 deals with this because we want to do new build and other stuff as well. So we were, we're quite cautious about who we'll work with. Yeah. But from that perspective, yeah, I mean, we looked at a 21 room um, guest house that we want to look at doing something with in the future. We'll probably look at actually giving that deal to someone else right now because we want to do it, but we want to do it in a sensible timeline. And I've got lots of other things that I do. I'm a non-exec for other construction businesses. I coach and mentor other people. I've got other pools on my time and writing a training program. So anything we do, we give 110% to it. And you know, if we've got somebody's money tied up in a deal, we want to be 150% sure that we've got the time and the life energy to put into them, giving them their return. Because you know, that's what it's all about for us. What would you say to anyone who's looking to find the right time to buy property? <laughs> Eleven thirty-nine. Now, it's it's absolutely now. I mean, we we there's not a week goes by we don't have a conversation that we kick ourselves that we didn't know this stuff fifteen years ago. Because if we had, we would be probably worth thirty to forty million quid now. Because the amount of money that we've earned that we would have used for other stuff that you know, I mean, we've been pretty fortunate. We haven't had a holiday in the last couple of years because of COVID. But before that, we used to have nice holidays. We used to eat in very, very nice restaurants in London. You know, what we spent on restaurants in a year, we could have bought a bite to let with. And we're like, do you know what? I so wish we'd have known this. And But how many people are in that situation? It's, yeah. you don't know what you don't know. That's the thing, isn't it? And people sort of get caught up of, oh, well, someone's telling me I'm ignorant. It's not a question of being told they're ignorant. It's just, there's loads of things we don't know we don't know. That's mm. why everybody has trades, isn't it? You know, your car, you wouldn't take that to the Ford dealership and get it serviced at Ford because they don't know how to deal with that vehicle. Yeah. It's exactly the same. It's the same in the training industry. People, people need to understand the stuff they don't know so that they can then benefit and leverage that knowledge to then go and build a, a, an asset that they can then use that asset to then get other stuff. So I would say get on board and do it now. Obviously, you said mentioned there about wishing you did it 20, 30 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, when you came to Profound Progressive two and a half years ago, if somebody told you two and a half years ago, and I remember you sitting in multiple streams of property income because it was in the big room upstairs and I was on stage, you were actually on the left hand side on the front row. I was. And you sat beside another builder. I did. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and were, I was like, who did put the two builders together? <laughs> but, yep. So you surround yourself with like minded people, and even in that room, you did that day. But. And, but you've obviously surrounded yourself with more people since. But if somebody came to you on that day at that multiple streams of property income two and a half years ago and told you that you'd um, be doing the projects you're doing right now and your wife would be full-time in property with you, what would you have said to them? I would have said, I'd like to know what crystal ball you're looking into because I didn't believe that that's where it would end up. And I think, you know, yes, we've got visions, we've got goals and stuff that we're working to. But it's just about, sometimes it's just about just putting that one foot forward and just going, do you know what, we're going to do something, we're going to do this and we'll see where it leads to. Because, you know, there's no, I mean, I've lost two good friends to suicide. There's no, there's absolutely no guarantee of tomorrow. I was talking to a developer, a friend of mine last week. He's one of his really good friends, dropped dead at 49 years old. It's completely out of loop. There's no guarantee of tomorrow. And there's, you know, Trying to provide for your family is absolutely it's what most of us want to do. That's one of our biggest goals, isn't it, as, as human beings? So there's no better way to do it than create an asset. And if you structure your businesses right, that, there's ways that that can be done to, to provide for, for multi-generations of your family going forward. Yeah. Just get involved and, and get started, I would absolutely, say. Absolutely, yeah. Take um, action. The people you've met in the last two and a half years, obviously you've gained a lot of knowledge and the knowledge has helped you, but mm. how important has the people been? How important? I think it's all about people. 
You know, if if there's no rapport or connection with somebody, you're not going to learn from them. You're not going to, you're not even, you're not going to listen to them. You're not going to give them the time. So for me, it's about being around the right people, and that's that's so that you can learn from them, but also so that you can serve. Because I, like, I mean, since working with Tony, I sort of GPS is kind of like my mantra: gratitude, perspective, and service. And that's like what I start every conversation with. And there are, you know, the the overwhelming majority of people in the community are absolutely phenomenal. Yes, there'll be the odd person that probably is a bit of a terrorist or a bit of a pain, but do you know what, for the most part, everybody just wants everyone else to get on and will happily share knowledge and information. And for that reason, it's, it's why we love being here. What's next for you? So where are you going? Where's that sort of long-term plan? So the long-term, pl- so my really, really BHAG, my big hairy-ass goal is I want to build a convalescent home for construction workers. And we're going to do it, so it's completely self-funded through charity. Um, we're going to do it as a, we're going to build it ourselves, well, not literally with my own hands, but I might do some of it. Um, so the idea is that we're going to keep building the SA business. The, any surplus from that is going to fund building that, building that, building that, whilst also doing some new build stuff because you know there's big chunky profits come out of new build, and then we're going to reinvest that into parcels of land. Once we've got enough that we can then build the, to build the convalescent place we'll do that but off the back of that we also want to build a community centre as well so that there's there's place for people to go and get respite spend time with their family because when Gemma was ill the police federation had that for police officers there is nothing like that for construction workers and so many people get physically or mentally injured that I just want to leave construction in a better place than when I found it because it's been really good to my family for multi-generations and the knowledge that I've got I want to use it knowledge and wisdom to have an impact and I got diagnosed with an illness seven years ago that's not currently treatable. And that really made me really kind of like think about my why. And that is ultimately my why is to serve other people. So, yeah, that's my big, big hairy ass goal. But then it's broken down into individual stuff. And, you know, there's a few nice cars for me along the way. and you, bits, But that's my primary driver. Do you think that um, people need a strong why to be able to take the action? I don't think you can take action without actually being clear on your why, and it's got to be really, really strong. And it, you know, the amount of people that have, it's kind of like a little bit fluffy, or you need to really, really actually. That's the that's the seed, if you like, at the centre of everything. Is what is the why? What gets you up, and what makes you passionate, and what makes you driven and determined to do it? Because, you know, yes, you can do it. It isn't always easy, and sometimes there are challenges and hurdles and obstacles to get over along the way. You're not going to be able to do that if you don't have that strong why. You need that courage and that commitment to actually get up every day and go, do you know what, we're going to do something, we're going to make a difference today. For anyone who just heard you say that and sits sitting at home or sit driving their car or whatever and they say to themselves, um, I'm not sure I have a why or I don't know what my why is, what would you say to them? Figure it out first. Before you do anything else, figure that out. and just. But take some time to do it. You know, this your why is not something you're going to figure out in five minutes by just saying, oh, "Okay, I'll think about it on the way to work tomorrow." B- block out some time in your diary. I'm I'm a massive fan of the block and tackle method of t- diary management. Block out some time in your diary to tackle the question, which is, "What is my why? What is it? What are my values? What's my vision? And what is my why? What is it that I'm trying to achieve? And that's what am I trying to achieve today for me? And like. Mindset is massive for me. So my mindset is lane one is me, lane two is my relationship with my wife, lane three is with my relationship with my kids, and then anything else in business is beyond that. So first of all, what is the driver for lane one? What is the thing that motivates that person? Because if you don't sort out the person in lane one, you can't possibly hope to be the good person that you need to be as a husband, partner, whatever you want to be, in lane two. And if you're not in a good, solid place in lane one and two, then lane three is going to be affected. And anybody that tells me that, and I see this when I coach people, it's really funny. You turn up to talk to people about business and they're like, listen, we ain't talking about no personal stuff. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But just let me manage your expectation. Personal stuff's going to come out because you can't separate the person and the business. You know, you know that as well as I do. So those kinds of things happen. So work out what it is that motivates you as a person and then absolutely focus on that and learn the power of no. If something doesn't fit with your vision, values and why, then just say thank you, but actually that's not for me. People will probably ultimately respect you more for doing it. One of the things that Rob Moore, co-founder of Progressive, said to me, and it's always stuck in my brain, is make your vocation your vacation. Yeah. Your vacation your vocation. Um, and it, it, they're intertwined. They're yeah. the same thing. 
I have to, not using those same words, but I quite often get asked this because people are like, it's so for you, like, you're really passionate about what you do. I'm like, I absolutely am passionate. And they're like, oh, that must be such a blessing. It is a blessing, a massive blessing, but it can also sometimes be a curse because when you absolutely love what you do, I don't feel like I'm at work. I just feel like I'm just enjoying my life in line with my vision, values and why. So I don't ever switch off. So my wife in lane two is like, for crying out loud, just stop. Like, why are you looking at a deal at 11 o'clock at night? We're in bed. We're meant to go to sleep. Like, look, just look at these details. Well, (laughs) not just going to sleep. So it is a blessing, but you do still need to manage it because it it can take over. And I think as an entrepreneur's challenge quite a lot is that actually it's just managing that and trying to work out whether we're actually that. You've got your wife on board now and she loves it and she found that com- that deal, the commercial deal. Mm. Um, what would you say to anybody who's also listening to this and thinking, oh, well, that's great for you, but my partner, they are not bought into it, whether they, the lady is and the guy's not, or the guy is and the lady's not, or vice versa, or lady and lady, whatever it yeah. may be, their partner's not bought into it. Um, what would you say to them um, in terms of being able to do this business either without their, their partner being bought into it or getting their partner on board? Okay, so there's two questions there. So, so I think the first thing is you can do it alone, and I speak to and meet people regularly that are successful in doing that, and that, that is perfectly acceptable. It would be infinitely easier to do it with your partner on board. But take a lesson from Stoney. Don't try and use a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. There is no point trying to absolutely just bombard someone with information. Work out what that person is. And what is that person's learning style preference? Do they, are you better sitting and showing them a visual of something and saying, this is what I want to create? Are you better talking to them? Are they better reading some words that are written down? Because if you understand how that person takes on board information in the first instance, you're far more likely to be successful. But talk to them at a point when they're, they're able to take on board the information. And I'm really crap at this, okay? So, to give you this, so last night, my wife was cooking dinner in the kitchen. I'm like, look, Blah, 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 blah. just had a call, we've got the, got the funding for this deal. She's like, I'm just cooking dinner, I'll talk to you. And I'm like, no, 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 you need to, un-. no. So I try really hard, but I don't, I'm not always perfect at it. But talk, meet the person where they're at. If the person's really, really stressed in their day job, they're not probably gonna be able to take on board too much more information. So do it in a way that is a, a sensible pace for that person, I would say. Right. Do you think that anybody can be successful in property business? I think anybody can with the right mindset because mindset is absolutely crucial. If you've got the education, you're halfway there. But, you know, we all have days when, we, you know, we're not firing on the beard of bang and feel 100%. But it's about recognising that and actually owning our own mindset because if we believe we can do it, I mean, Henry Ford's got a great quote about if you think you're right, you're right. If you think you're wrong, you're wrong. Whatever it is, it's pretty similar to that, I think. I'm not going to paraphrase him. But... Essentially, if you get the education and understand what it is you're trying to achieve and you put the action into doing it, any, anybody can do it. You've only got to look at the absolute diversity of the people that have gone through Progressive to, for demonstration of it. For anybody who wants to find you, reach out to you, follow your journey, how can they find you? They can find me on LinkedIn, where I'm just Richard Stone. They can find me on Instagram, rmstone2011, or Facebook, where I'm just Richard Stone. Or Stoney. Or well, Stoney, as somebody called me today. Richard Stoney. So, guys, you've been listening to the Progressive Property Podcast. I've been Kevin McDonnell. He's been Richard Stone. And I think you're going to, that was awesome. Um, I've got some really good inspiration, motivation. Now, I just want to go out and do even more now, having listened to that. So, make sure you subscribe to the podcast route every single week. Also, go check out the Progressive Property YouTube channel. There's content there every single week. And anybody interested in getting started in property, well, go over to the Progressive Property Facebook page, join the Progressive Property community on Facebook, and you can find out more about things like multiple streams of property income. Follow Richard Stone, subscribe to the podcast. I'll see you next week. Speak soon.